I'm talking with Dr. Paul Andronis today. He's from Northern Michigan University, where he's um, a professor in the Department of Psychology. Dr. Andronis is coordinator for the Behavior Analysis Option for Majors. Dr. Andronis, how did you become a behavior analyst? Uh, I was a biology major as an undergraduate, and um, I took an, a, my, a, the only real psychology course that I took as an undergraduate was the intro course, and in it, it was the typical intro um, textbook with chapters on scientific method, physiological psych learning, and so on, right through all the topics. And in addition to each one of those chapters, we had to read a book that was coordinated with it. So with the physiological psych chapter, we had to read Brave New World. Um, and when we got to the chapter on learning, we wrote this, we had to read this funny book that didn't really talk about psychology, but um, it was the first thing that really made sense beyond the physio chapter. Um, and it was a book about an experimental community that was using applied psychology to, to help people live happier, more productive lives in a more equitable community and so on. It was Walden too. And uh, I thought, wow, if this is psychology, this is really cool. And uh, by the time we got to the midsection of the learning chapter, when they had gotten through classical conditioning and operant conditioning, and then they talked about SDS delta discrimination, they had a nice close-up picture of the pigeon pecking um, the red key and sitting back when the key was green, and then the chapter switched to cognitive and the rest of the book was nonsense. It made no sense to me, um, very little sense anyway, especially coming from biology and chemistry background and all the physics and this other stuff was just like fiction. And um, I said, where, where did this stuff from the learning chapter go? There's nothing else in the textbook that, that's even referring to this stuff. Uh, well, I, you know, I said after that course, well, maybe if I take another course, I'll run into that stuff again. And I took one more course, and it was actually painful. I, I mean, I had to fight my way to sit through the class, and then I vowed I was going to take any more psychology because it was trash, and it was too bad this guy Skinner hadn't written anything else. Um, as a junior or senior, I ran into Joe Lang. He was a student at, Northern, at uh, Western Illinois. We were both undergrads. And um, we got into a discussion. I had read, at that point, I'd read Darwin, and I was starting to get interested in Conrad Lorenz's work and how um, behavior could be programmed in some way in the genes and in the nervous system. And uh, I got into several arguments about Joe with Joe about the, the causes of behavior and control of behavior, and he said to me, you know, you know, this is fun, he said, but I can't talk to you. You're too stupid. You have to read something. And so he threw a book at me, um, and he said, read this over the weekend, and then we'll have something to talk about because you really don't know what you're talking about with this stuff. And it was Skinner's Verbal Behavior. And I didn't realize it at the time until I got back home, and when I opened up um, the book they had uh, in the book, a list of other things he'd read, and I recognized Walden too was there, and it's the same guy. And so I read it, and um, by the end of the week, I was asking him for other things, and he gave me Science and Human Behavior and a couple of other of the early writings. And after that, I was just hooked. Um, I it melded so perfectly with what I thought a science of behavior should be. And um, it touched on all the areas that psychology seemed to um, give over to fictional explanations. Um, and as a biologist, it appealed to me just because it was amenable to the same rules of evidence and um, the same truth tests that you get in biological concepts. It just made sense. Um, but after that, it was hooked. Wonderful. What was it like to be a behavior analyst during your early years in the field? It, it happened before I was actually formally a behavior analyst because I stayed a biology major. I graduated with my degree in zoology, and then I went on and got a master's degree in cell biology and molecular biology. Um, but during that time, for example, as an undergraduate, Joe Lang had already gotten some expertise in programmed instruction. Um, he had been in contact with Sue Markle at the University of Illinois, um, had done some, uh, some work on projects that um, he submitted to them, and they mentored him through the early phases of his training in programmed instruction. So he started a program at Western Illinois called the Center for Innovative Design and Programmed Instruction, CIDPI. It's a student-run organization. Um, they applied for a grant and got about a $150,000 grant from the state of Illinois. And it was meant to introduce programming methods into college classrooms. And Joe asked me to come on board and learn uh, programming and to help program the material for biological sciences. And so I started doing programming um, in that context. Um, and we 
put together uh, uh, some PSI courses for the sociology department and so on. And so that was my first um, actual experience doing anything other than arguing with somebody about behavior analysis. Um, and it was so appealing because you could actually see changes and you could actually monitor changes with objective measures. Um, we had not only the students' performance in class, but how many hours we had them logging, how many hours they were studying, how many units they got through per sitting, what the duration of their studying was. Um, we tried to build up study habits from the ground up, and we also kept track of um, the change from the first year when a lot of people were very resistant about using any of these procedures in the classroom. And by the second year, we had profs from the social department coming in and asking us to program courses. We had about a dozen courses in sociology that they were asking for program. Most of us um, got, when I when I was doing that, um, I borrowed some of the books from the program's library and there was a, a pair of books on calculus, program text on calculus, and I, I knew I was staring at calculus two years down the line to finish up my degree. And uh, boy, it made, I, I didn't really, um, from the first-hand experience standpoint, I didn't have any idea really what a different experience it was to use that kind of programming to accomplish something that almost everybody has done some other way. And uh, it was it was a, a, such a different experience that I realized that you could actually change people's lives with these kinds of things. Um, and so once I graduated with my master's degree in biology, um, uh, a couple of things happened. One was um, I was taking a seminar, it was a graduate seminar on molecular biology, and the topic at that time was a relatively new topic, so it tells you how long ago this was, but neurotransmitters. Um, it was um, a seminar that talked about how neurotransmitters worked, where they worked, um, what people thought was the genetic code of the brain, so to speak, how, how neurons encode information. And they made a big deal out of the fact that there were four neurotransmitters, just like there were four base pairs in DNA, and they said they may have cracked it. And, um, so a bunch of pop articles had appeared, uh, again, that we were asked to read. Most of it was the typical um, quiet propaganda of drug companies um, setting you up so that uh, you turn to that industry and they were claiming that um, now that we are pretty close to understanding the code the brain uses, we're going to be able to manufacture drugs that create a specific code in the brain and um, someday you'll be able to take a pill, for example, at nighttime and in the morning get up and you'll know calculus. And I thought, wow, this is pretty heady stuff. Um, and then they talked about how psychiatric drugs um, were being used to surgically change the symptoms of mental illness to leave the person's personality, core personality intact, but to remediate a lot of the problems. Uh, but all this was pretty stirring stuff and it didn't square with what I knew about behavior from behavior analysis. So instead of going on and getting my doctorate right away in, in biology, um, I took a couple of years off and worked in psychiatry so I could see what those drugs looked like up close, what they actually did, um, how they were used, and so on. Um, this was at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. It was one of the Northwestern University hospitals. Um, I got a chance to see mental illness up close and really um, different behavior, uh, very disturbing behavior in some cases because I worked on a locked psychiatric unit. Um, I got to see the use of almost every popular drug in psychiatry. Uh, what I came to see as a misuse of those drugs because um, after two years of really close observation, not only of the effects of the drugs, but also the sorts of procedures that were used typically in psychiatry, um, I had made my decision at that point that they had nothing, um, that they not only didn't understand what the drugs were doing, but they had, in a way, maliciously misrepresented what these drugs did to people, um, and that they weren't doing society or the people they were um, treating much of a service with the kind of terrible, shabby treatment um, it was ineffectual. It was largely um, maintenance. Uh, I didn't see, in, in that time, I didn't see many of the people who were taking the medication do anything but stopping a problem to the people who complained about the behavior in the first place. Um, and uh, at around that time, um, Joe Lang was working in one of the other hospitals and uh, had set up a couple of programs there. And so I began uh, pushing to do the same thing. It, at the hospital I was in, and um, we got to talk to Joe, through Sue Markle's grad student, Joe got a contact with Izzy Goldman in Chicago, 
and um, he agreed to talk to both of us. We told him, Sue Markle told us to meet you, and so on. And um, after I met Dr. Gold Diamond, he, his secretary was ready to shoot me because um, he had a very tight schedule. And when I went to visit him, he decided he was going to grill me. And uh, we ended up talking for about three or four hours. Lucy said to him that he had missed a faculty meeting. He said he didn't care. And he told me when I left that if I was going to apply to Chicago, make sure that, he mentioned, that I mentioned that I talked to him. So I did. I, I went there. And my earliest piece of behavior analysis activity, aside from the school part of it, I mean, that was really the first formal class I was having as well. But we were assigned to a fluency program where we were working with people who stuttered. Um, I was an assistant to somebody who was doing schedule-induced defecation research. Um, and we were all required to kick in on this state um, Department of Mental Health project to put constructional procedures into state hospitals, um, teach the staff constructional methods. And that was really the first applied stuff that I ever did as a student. Um, and it never changed after that. We were constantly doing those kinds of things from then on. Fantastic. What work would you like to be remembered for? If I can, if I can ask you this produced. question now. The students that produced. Fantastic. Uh, um, how do you think behavior analysis has changed over the years of your career? Or has it changed? And if so, how? I, I'd say that some of the wind's been taken out of the sails because we've made less progress than we should have for the early growth pattern. And um, I'm not sure why that is, except that um, in the 70s, when the so-called cognitive revolution came along, the money dried up in this field. Cognitive departments have gotten so much money, and they get these bright students who they train in their area, and they can talk a great game, but they contributed absolutely nothing to our knowledge in, in education or in psychiatry or anything else. Our people go out on a shoestring budget um, wheedle their way through with quick fixes and things. Um, some pretty astounding changes, but the research base hasn't um, proceeded to grow. We've got interesting growth areas, but not the kind of progress that we could have been making um, as in the early days. I, I always point out to the students in my applied behavior analysis course, I show them the Lovas film on uh, behavioral treatment of children with autism, and they say, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty spectacular. Um, how come is this stuff really that new? I said, this movie was in the 1980s, early 1980s, based on cases in the 70s, which were treated with procedures we've known about since the 1960s. So you tell me, uh, you know. Uh, and it hasn't, treatment of autism has not changed that much. There are a few smaller changes. We do a much better job with verbal behavior. Um, we've streamlined some of the procedures. But uh, it still is not anywhere nearly as effective as it could be, I think. And it's because we haven't incorporated into it um, things like fluency building for certain repertoires, um, finding key repertoires that uh, once put in place will um, grow. You know, Beth Salter Azarov's book um, on behavior, applied behavior analysis, in the chapter on goals, she talks about um, using pivotal repertoires among the goals that would expand into other things. So you teach one and you get five things from it. And um, autism treatment hasn't, hasn't really done that that effectively. Um, the Kegels in California at Santa Barbara do what's called pivotal response training and they get some of that sense, but they don't use thoroughgoing behavioral procedures for the rest of it. And they're trained behaviorally from what I understand. Um, but we need we need to have the sense that there's a lot of growth area. People, um, uh, the the movement, forward movement has slowed down. I think that's the biggest change I've seen. Um, in the 70s, when there was still grant money flowing in, pharmaceutical companies um, who sank the original money into behavior analysis because it provided really good, uh, stable baselines for the testing drugs and so on, um, that initial spurt of growth with drug company money coming in um, stopped in, in the late 70s. In fact, it stopped in the early 70s when cognitive psychology gave expert systems to the military and started getting a flood of money into artificial intelligence research. Uh, but our money dried up at the time, and I, you know, I visit several departments around the country, and um, a lot of them are giving up their research labs because they aren't supported any longer with funds. 
Uh, students bring pigeons on carts into conference rooms, run their sessions, and then take them back. And that you're not going to learn how to build equipment. You're not going to learn how to manage a laboratory and how to cannibalize equipment and, and how to reshuffle existing equipment to make new things that you can ask some novel questions with. If we keep relying on store-bought stuff, people are going to be doing store-bought experiments. Um, so is there anything in your career that you would have done differently? I might have taken, um, well, I, I might have um, gone to a research university where I wouldn't have to have such a high teaching load and I could have played more in the laboratory. Um, instead, I opted to go to a teaching university where the research was incidental and I didn't get the research stuff that I, I wanted to get done, done. We just recently added a master's program, so I'm actually getting some master's level students to do some of the experiments I've put off. But um, that would be the one thing I would change, is to be in an environment that supported doing the experiments and also having time enough to write them up. I'm a plotter. I, you know, in many ways, I don't like things leaving my hands until they're just right. And um, I, I can't do it on the fly. I have to focus on it. I need blocks of time. And with a heavy teaching load, we teach three courses a semester. And I, I have, because I'm the, the coordinator for the behavior analysis program, I advise about 80 students. And they all come in different times during the semester. Um, I get absolutely no time in my office when I can actually get anything else done. So that would be the one thing I would change is maybe going to a different university environment that fostered a little bit uh, better um, time allocation for research and scholarly activity. What areas of the field, or in your area of the field, would you like to see more work in? Maybe you talked about that a little bit. But. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the areas that I would like to see more done, and, and in fact it's a growth area now, is the relation between biological um, structures um, and behavioral outcomes. Um, one of the areas, for example, um, autism, as important as I think it is momentarily for behavior analysis, I think it's also a pit where if we put all of our efforts into treatment of autism, uh, you know, once they find out it, whether this is actually um, preventable, um, the field will disappear afterwards if they don't need remediation, if they can prevent it or if they can treat it through some sort of medication or physical manipulation. Um, it's what happened with polio. Uh, there was a sister, Kenny, who had devised a way of doing therapy for kids with polio uh, to avoid the paralysis later. Uh, the kids recovered completely. And um, it was through physical manipulation of the muscles and so on. And uh, nobody knows her anymore because the salt vaccine and the Sabin vaccines came along and eliminated polio as a major problem. Um, and yet here's this person who, uh, she was a nurse. The doctors didn't um, take her seriously at first, but she essentially did um, good physical therapy procedures. I, I wouldn't like to see that happen to behavior analysis, but autism provides one of these opportunities as a research opportunity um, to understand what's the relationship between some really subtle, maybe some subtle biological um, variables and the trajectory that takes you to the kinds of complex behavior we expect of people versus the sort of stunted growth that a lot of kids with autism have or the, the odd set of repertoires that they do develop. Um, there, is, there are recent data uh, from neurobiology that in these kids, the neurology that defines the, um, the pathways that are called reinforcement pathways are the ones that are involved in reinforcement of behavior. And connections between those areas, the emotional areas, and the frontal lobe that are associated with face recognition and a few other functions, that some of those connections are weaker um, in kids with autism. And it would be in keeping with um, the idea that uh, many times reinforcement has the, um, has the characteristic of increasing the behavior, but it doesn't change the affective component. There's no underlying affective content to the reinforcement experience. The way other people talk about pleasure when something happens that is also a reinforcer, kids with autism don't seem to, um, to have their behavior reinforced by things that also make them feel good. Um, those things are, are, seem to be distinct. Um, facial recognition, they can recognize faces but they don't have the affective response to familiar faces that other kids do. They see mom and it's, it's a sort of an indifferent response in some respects. It turns out that um, in the pyroform gyrus, it's in the high up in the visual association area, um, 
most people's uh, face recognition activities, if you give them a task to recognize a face, um, that area lights up in most people. With kids with autism, other parts light up, and it turns out that not just a different part, but a different part in each one of these kids. They recognize faces perfectly well, but they're using idiosyncratic parts of the brain, parts that don't seem to uh, be a common area for face recognition, and it's, um, it's individual. It's not like all kids with autism see the faces and this part lights up, it's different places. It's distributed in other areas, and it would be interesting to know how much that contributes to kids, um, the, some of the autistic features, some of the aloneness features, and failure to make connections. So I think that's a really important area that behavior analysis can contribute to by um, asking some of the right questions. Um, all these great imaging techniques they have aren't matched by the psychological procedures they're using to have people do things while they're on a scanner. Um, in behavior analysis, we've got enough really interesting control procedures, especially stimulus control procedures, that will give us an unambiguous question and answer from a behavioral standpoint and then be able to make a connection more strongly with an area of activity on these scans. But uh, we don't do that much. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's because of a pre-existing prejudice against um, doing anything that smacks of organic uh, uh, approaches, but I think that we have uh, probably the most to contribute to those areas of biological psychology, and um, that I think would be a really important growth area. It's my own prejudice, though, from my background, I I'm sure. I can appreciate that. <laughs> I think the, the preparation is obviously very important, and um, we might as well not agree. Um, so what do you see as the future of behavior analysis? And again, you touched on it, but, but um, paint me a picture in 10, 20, 30 years, what do you hope will be doing? Well, what I hope and what I think will happen may be two different things, but they aren't different. Um, I, I don't know that the name is going to stick around. In fact, I, I'm not sure it's the right name anyway. I think it's the part, of the, uh, part of our problem is the name uh, because it includes the word behavior. And um, people think of behavior as being superficial and it you know, forces us into talking about, well, um, what causes the behavior? Well, they're going to resort then to the little man inside or the person inside, the homunculus and um, it completely invalidates what we stand for, and that will continue as long as we keep saying behavior analysis. I think we probably would be much better off calling it contingency analysis because in essence that's what we do. We don't analyze behavior, we analyze behavior in the context of reinforcement contingencies and punishment contingencies, and that people aren't going to dispute as readily. Uh, in fact, they can't. Um, cognitive psychology is um, they, they've used a concept called the, the condition action pair, and uh, it's their meat and potatoes. It's the equivalent of their stimulus response, and it, it's something that um, I always enjoy when people talk about condition action pairs in a debate with me about um, cognitive versus behavioral procedures because they usually start off saying, well, behaviorism is very simple as our associations. And, and then they bring up this nonsense about condition action pairs, and I say, well, condition action pairs is actually a stimulus response relation because the action is the cognitive outcome or the outcome of this cognitive, um, the, this this cognitive uh, variable. Um, so it's just an SR. The, the condition is the stimulus for this action, this cognitive action, and so it's an SR model. The behavioral model, on the other hand, isn't. The arrow doesn't go from the discriminative stimulus to the behavior. That is really an hand statement. It's a dash. And it's a simultaneous occurrence of simply two events. And the arrow is from that pair of variables to the consequence. And it's a very different model. It's an RS model, if you want to call it anything. Um, what's funny about that is that now cognitive psychologists are saying, well, part of the way these condition action pairs are formed is from feedback. If they're talking about reinforcement. And in fact, um, the, the newer areas of cognitive science um, are using a consequential model. They talk about strengthening only. They, they, it's, it's like they cannot bring themselves to use the word reinforcement. They can't bring themselves to use the word contingency. They're reinventing a vocabulary, but it's becoming more and more behavioral, uh, uh, a more of a contingency model. And that's where I think what I think is going to happen to behavior analysis is that once people get over the idea that they don't have a behavioral model and they see that this is, in fact, a really useful way of framing the world, um, we're probably going to eventually end up being the dominant or a predominant model. Uh, but it won't, 
it won't happen until people won't have to say give Skinner all the credit for it and won't have to say that well, the behaviors were right all along. It's not going to happen that way, and people in behavior analysis really need to understand that um, it's not going to be psychology. It's going to be a whole different approach um, to behavior uh, from what other psychologists have thought of. It's going to look just like what we've been doing and what we want to do, but it's going to be talked about in a different way, and the history will be portrayed very differently as well. Um, but I think we still are going to end up being major players, major contributors. Um, certainly, uh, in fact, if you, the APS Journal, the president of APS, about two years ago wrote an editorial that was called, I think, uh, What Happened to All the Behaviorists? And his answer was, um, we are the behaviorists. It reminded me a little of uh, 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 the Martian Chronicles, um, Ray Bradbury's book, where people discover the Martians and find out that we are the Martians. They transplanted us. And this guy was claiming that um, although the field of behavior analysis has disappeared, which I thought was pretty funny, um, he said that psychology has adopted so many of the, the central tenets that really psychology has been transformed by behavioral approaches. Not This was all news to me. I haven't seen any evidence of that. But he was pretty strong about it. And uh, apparently, um, he caught some flack in some quarters, but a lot of behavior analysts wrote to him and said, uh, it's about time. <laughs> uh, nothing has come of that. They haven't talked about that since. And uh, uh, yeah, I haven't seen people any any more frequently or more strongly claim that they have some sort of behavioral heritage in standard psychology, but it was a nice gesture anyway. Yeah. So, final sort of thoughts. Um, what message would you like to send to students of the future? And I won't call them behavior analysis students. I, I, I would, just because that's where we are right now, and now I'm at Kreskin, you know, I can't see the future. But um, I, I think if the students are as good as the ones that I've um, seen while I've been at some of the schools, including this, and especially the uh, University of North Texas, um, the students are going to do, uh, are, are going to be the progress. And as long as they keep the level of enthusiasm and the level of curiosity that they have right now, they'll grow the field. The only other thing I would, I would say to students to make sure that that happens um, is to learn as much as they can about everything. They need to learn about literature, they need to learn about physics, they need to learn about electronics, um, they need to learn about economics, because all of these things are byproducts of behavior. And when people want accounts of behavior, they want accounts that are coherent enough and comprehensive enough to account for things in all those areas. And you can't do that if all you focused on is behavior analysis and if you, um, you know, treatment areas where we're interested, people who are well versed in autism and know nothing else aren't going to be very valuable to the field. They'll be a tremendous asset to the community um, in treatment terms, but they won't grow the field. We need people who can compete intellectually in all these areas um, and be good at contingency analysis. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.